So uh, coming back to the flow, um, so a few words on the on the progress of the research. So uh, most likely you have seen the page uh, that is online uh, today. Uh, so today, well, it was like online uh, since one week. Let me just go through the page quickly to uh, share with you a little bit of uh, how you can get the latest updates on the research. So here you will see that uh, we are going to always uh, integrate all the blog posts that are somehow related to, to the to the um, to the research. Uh, so there's going to be a filtering of our blog post, and here in this page you're going to only find the research updates. Uh, the last one in particular was uh, an effort for us to really make sense of uh, some of the first conversations that we have had. Uh, in the last couple of weeks with the first, uh, well, maybe a little bit more, I think it was four weeks with our uh, podcast uh, hosts, uh, sorry, guests. And uh, uh, you also see here all the podcasts that we have uh, recorded so far and the ones that are coming soon will be also here in this, in this space. Uh, the podcast is available everywhere, basically every platform you use, you can find it. Then uh, let me also spend a word on our um, community um, campaign. Uh, so, um, it, it, so to, to support this this research, we basically prepared uh, a way for for our community to uh, to participate. You can find here two packages. One is the community package, and the one is the explorers package. So let me start with the community one. The community one is a package that is designed for individuals. So uh, individuals, they want to support this research. And it's basically a package that it's like a crowdfunding package, or a, we call it a community founding package that basically allows you to get one printed, uh, one fine printed copy, uh, interactive access to this uh, uh, one day ecosystem sense making conference that we are organizing for the 30th of June. Uh, when we say interactive access, I mean that this conference will likely be streamed by uh, YouTube, but uh, you will have access to, to, to the room, to the Zoom room for the interaction with the speakers. Then uh, there will be uh, a possibility to access early releases of the white paper as soon as they become available. And, uh, you know, uh, this 20% discount to each of our events in the coming future. Also, together with that, for those of you that are interested, uh, you will be able to buy tickets for participation to our uh, trainings uh, with a 25% discount uh, as we, if you book it together with the uh, community package. So basically the community package for those that are uh, interested in the training events is more or less free. So essentially uh, that's an opportunity if you are, if some of you or some of your contacts are interested in getting a certification or, or joining one of our master classes, to uh, get the community package uh, for free. Uh, then when it comes to the Explorer pack is a bit different. So if you have an organization or you're part of an organization that wants to explore and to uh, leverage uh, the main outputs of this research, uh, we, are, we crafted this, uh, basically this proposal that is uh, uh, based on a half day workshop uh, with uh, a focus on integrating the result of the research into the company strategy, into the team strategy. Uh, so it's going to be a nice way for companies to uh, spend uh, half a day and uh, with us, with some of our facilitators, integrating the research of the, the uh, results of the research and get a report that will drive, will guide the, the company to implement uh, some of the strategic outputs uh, into the strategy in the coming months. So that's another package that we created. And also for this package, uh, the company can buy uh, trainings. And uh, in, this in this case, it's gonna be 25% discount. So uh, I just wanted to spend a word on that because um, uh, we, we uh, of course, we count on our community to support this, this research. And then we, we, we crafted these packages uh, for you, for, for, for you and for your companies. So coming back to the, to the presentation, uh, these are some uh, resume, uh, information that I, we will make available, uh, but more or less is what I just said. Uh, so how is it going to work today? Um, so, so today, first of all, we are going to, uh, uh, and then I'm going to, I'm going to quickly uh, uh, link, uh, show you the the Miro board. 
So first of all, we're going to spend the first uh, uh, probably half an hour uh, together with Stina introducing you to the main inside inside uh, space uh, that we created after this uh, first uh, uh, essentially uh, six uh, I think if I'm not wrong six interviews. Uh, then for each of these uh, spaces, we are going to share with you uh, some uh, directly some the words of our um, speak our, our, our podcast uh, guests. So uh, we're going to listen to some excerpts of the interviews, then uh, comment quickly uh, with Stina, uh, giving you a little bit of overview of uh, uh, the overall topic. Because after that, we're going to have spend 25 minutes in breakout rooms. Uh, for you to join. So, so it would be possible for you to join these breakout rooms and talk uh, more specifically about one of these uh, specific aspects that are emerging from the research. And uh, during this conversation, you will also be able to edit the board. So you will be able to add more post-its where you can add some emerging insight, uh, insight from the conversation. At the moment, we have five groups. The group number one is focused on uh, the role of technology and uh, the epistemic frames that are related to technology. So this is one of the emerging aspects of the research. Another one is gonna be about the local global interplay. Uh, then another uh, group is about uh, changes in perception of value and social transition dynamics. Group number four is going to be about jobs, works, and capabilities, and policy making. And the group number five is essentially about uh, brands and organizations. Okay, so these are five topics, macro topics that connect some micro micro topics. Um, and then uh, again, as I said, we're going to listen quickly to some excerpts, relate those excerpts to these uh, groups have a little bit of uh, shedding on our side, Stina and myself, and open for your question to uh, introduce the group a little bit more. And then we're gonna jump into this breakout room for 25 minutes. So you can choose whatever group you wanna add, you wanna join. If you wanna change the group, we're gonna give you also uh, instructions on how to leave one group and enter another one. So uh, I hope uh, more or less uh, this, is, this is clear. Any question at the moment? That's it, okay. So, um, know that we are recording this uh, call because we normally make the frontal, you know, the group part, the group discussion part, we make it available on YouTube. So if you intervene, uh, you know, you will be of course uh, visible on YouTube. So, so keep this in mind. Um, Okay, so I will go directly and, and start uh, quickly with uh, sharing with you uh, a, a couple of excerpts on, on the topic of group number one, and then uh, complement quickly with Stina uh, uh, um, on the topic and leave you uh, ask some questions if you, if you want to clarify and then move to the other groups. So when it comes to uh, group number one, this group number one is, uh, as I said, is about the role of technology. So, so we connect the role of technology in society with uh, tec both technological trends and also the epistemological frames, uh, because we are pretty much aware that there is a, an overlap and an interaction between these topics. And we wanted to share with you uh, 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 about group one, one quote from uh, Arthur Brock, that I'm going to, uh, uh, to uh, share, share with you in this way. So uh, we're gonna uh, show this on the screen and I'm gonna play uh, the audio. So please let me know if you guys can uh, hear, uh, you should be able to hear it, but uh, I want to be sure that you hear it properly. So if anybody has issues with audio, uh, let us know. And in the meantime, you can follow the, uh, the um, speech, let's say the extract of the speech on the, on the screen. I will make it a bit bigger so you can watch it uh, uh, more clearly. I guess I have this picture of, um, of, a, of a ladder where one side of the ladder, the rail, one rail of the ladder is consciousness and, you know, the story, the vision, the mythos, the, the ways that you think. And the other is the embodied practical physical tools. And you have to be able to kind of build up both sides of the ladder at once, or, you know, 
on par with each other. And then you can build, have rungs that go across in the form as, in the form of practical projects that embody both a changed consciousness as well as a new set of capacities embodied in the tools. I, I guess I have. So why we took this excerpt from Arthur Brock's interview? Um, so when we think about technology and uh, uh, here, Stina, please add your considerations after I, I, I do this quick uh, reflection. But essentially what we, uh, what we want to stress in this uh, research work is that there is this uh, circular relationship between technologies and organizing and in general, uh, as you know, you know, our focus here is to understand better how organizing is going to, sh is going to shift. So what we identified is that uh, there is this uh, circular relationship between technologies and organizations. And so we explored with uh, Arthur and uh, with some of other, uh, the other uh, speakers in our, in our podcast, uh, um, the, this idea that uh, sometimes, uh, um, of course, you know, it's important to, uh, to acknowledge that uh, the cultural elements that uh, guide us in building new organizations are, are relevant and to some extent prevalent, but uh, the need to design uh, different technologies is acknowledge as uh, uh, designing a different technology can enable a different way of organizing. So, so one thing that we want to understand better is this relationship. Should we focus more as um, designers, organizations or, or, or brands uh, in creating new technologies so that these new technologies can enable a different way of organizing? So, so for example, that was our point, starting point in actually interviewing uh, Holochain. As you know, Holochain is uh, at least, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 praises this idea that is based on a naturally uh, uh, bio-inspired design patterns. So, so the question is, is such a technology that is much less uh, uh, universalized, much more centered around the, the, the local elements and the agents, uh, is going to make it possible to, to design new organizations? This is a question that we want to explore. So that, that's one, one starting point for those of you that uh, want to join the conversation on technology. Stina, do you want to add something based on your experience in interviewing Arthur? No, sorry, I'm having a little bit of a computer issue at the moment. So I basically can't see my screen. Uh, I might need to just rejoin, restart okay. my computer. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. So you rejoin and we wait you here. I will move into group yeah, number, number two. So when it comes to group number two, uh, I want to share with you uh, another, uh, uh, a few quotes. Uh, uh, well, I think in, num in group number two, I only have one. Uh, so I'm going to share with you this. And group number two is group, uh, uh, the group that regard, uh, with, regarding global local interplay. Sorry, not this. That's a quote from an interview with John Robb. And, um, you know, my general philosophy with resilience in the modern world at the individual and the community level is to um, connect with the bigger system on your own terms. So what that means is um, you build enough productive capacity or reserve capacity um, so that if the bigger system goes down, you can still function. You can still uh, achieve your goals. Uh, but on the other hand, you don't want to totally disconnect or overproduce at the local level to the point where you, you are uh, competing with, you know, more efficiently produced stuff at the at the at the macro level. So uh, I, we decided to quote this uh, aspect of uh, from from John Robb's uh, interview because uh, it's crucial to understand what we believe is going to be one of the uh, leading opportunities and one of the leading um, aspects I think we need to understand of this of this research. So 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 it appears that in the transition, especially in, in the wake of uh, COVID nineteen outbreak, uh, it appears that uh, we um, 
we will need to uh, relocalize part of our productive capacity. And, in, uh, and the starting point for our conversation that we want to offer is that uh, as we uh, essentially build this uh, re resilient capacity locally, uh, so essentially we build redundant, redundant systems, uh, uh, this represents quite a, a massive transition with respect to uh, uh, the industrialized approach and the globalized approach that we are put, pretty used in our current economy, especially in, in, in a way that uh, by deliberately introducing redundancy, we may have to, uh, uh, to sacrifice some, uh, ele some uh, um, aspect, some, some, uh, to some extent, the, uh, the uh, efficiency. So, so this is one point that we would love to really uh, let you discuss in the breakout room. So what happens as we move from the globalized economy into a more an economy that is much more an interplay of local and global? Uh, and what does it mean in terms of user expectations? And what does it mean in terms of entrepreneurial opportunity as well? Because this is also another pretty important aspect that, uh, that um, uh, that needs to be highlighted. So this represents most likely a space where entrepreneurial activity, also in forms of platforms, can play out in the next, in the coming, in the coming uh, years. So that, that's another thing. Sina, you back, right? Yeah, no, it, it seems uh, solved. Do you, do you want to add something on group number two? Uh, no, from what I heard, the last. Uh, that's. Case. I think that's. I mean, we also talked. I think maybe one thing, but I don't know if you already mentioned if it was before I jumped in. But it was this. Uh, we had this conversation both with Michel Bowens and uh, Thomas Diaz about uh, global knowledge networks and local production. But that you, I think you already. Uh, well, I didn't. I, I didn't uh, stress this point, but you made. Uh, you're right. Actually, this is worth. Uh, it's worth mentioning because uh, it's a recurring element that came out uh, with the several in, in our interviews. So, so the Fab the, Citizen. That's the blue post-it there. Yeah, there are the blue post-its here that can be uh, can be uh, um, explored. But in general, the big point is. Uh, uh, increasingly, we see um, uh, local uh, fabrication, local uh, economies to, uh, sorry, local, uh, um, the local paradigm to work out when, when built with uh, tangible stuff and the uh, globalized uh, markets to, to deal with uh, the light stuff, as uh, Michel Bowen made, make uh, made it uh, clear. So that, that's another point that I think uh, we think is important to discuss. Then, when it comes to group three, that is more related to social dynamic, cultural dynamics, and changes in perception of value, we, we want to quote you um, two, two speakers. One is uh, um, John Robb, and one is, again, and one is Anna Angelic. So let's uh, start with the John Robb uh, with a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of ex ex excerpts that are more related to understanding the transition between markets and networks. Uh, we believe that this is really important to, to, to listen. So uh, let me let me share it with you. Sorry, this one. So I will I will open both of them so I can share it with you in uh, in. Uh, Okay, it's actually three excerpts that we believe are really important to, uh, to figure out. So let's start with this. You know, we are, as a society, each of our societies uh, uh, make decisions as groups uh, using these methods. One is tribes, T, uh, that's uh, in the past that used to be, you know, tribalism. Um, it used to be, uh, you know, very crude forms of, of, of ways of organizing or, you know, kind of relationships between people. Um, most recently in modern history, it's nationalism. Uh, it provides us cohesion. It, it lets you know uh, who is similar to you or who's working on your side or should be working on your side at least. Um, so, you know, tribalism is, is an important kind of decision-making methodology. Uh, second is that institutions, that's, that's basically uh, bureaucracies. Uh, like uh, Max Weber would say, you know, bureaucracy is the kind of the cockroach of organizations. It, it transformed us into the modern world. It, it made science possible, it made corporations possible, it made big government possible, allowed scalable infrastructures possible. Um, 
bureaucracies are, are great at uh, mobilizing resources, allocating uh, resources, making plans, uh, building things, uh, organizing vast numbers of people. What we need to have for a world that changes that quickly is 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 a network decision making system. And I think what we're seeing globally is is some form of that developing. You know, it used to be that you'd have to, as an individual, determine whether something is true or not, and that you'd have to have institutions protect you uh, to make sure that you only had this true information. But in a network world, I, I throw it out to my network, and we think as a group, there's always somebody in that in my network that that will say, "Hey, that's wrong. That picture is false. Uh, that's misinformation, or uh, that doesn't tell the whole story. Here's the here's the, the rest of the story." Uh, so, in a large sense, that or to a large degree, you're you're thinking as a network, and you're only as smart as your network. You know. So, so that extract from uh, John Robb uh, interview, I think it's crucial to uh, understand essentially two things. It's, uh, it's, it's crucial to understand that the, the transition, and uh, we we're going to point you to um, this uh, TIMN framework from David Newton. Uh, that was particularly interesting, I, I believe. Um, the transition to networks is not going to happen as a as a change of state. It's going to happen as a new layer of governance that is uh, developed on top of existing layers. So that's the insights that, that we are de developing thanks to these conversations. And in this new layer, the layer of network, there is a new potential for governance that goes much beyond what, what is the governance model that we have that we have now. So another thing that we want to add on top of this uh, is another reflection on, on, on social dynamics because it's, it is true that those networks, these networks are, are generating, are creating new capabilities for governance. Also the perception of value across these networks is going to shift much faster and in a much more networked way than we used to. And to do that, we wanna use a link, a quote from the work, uh, from the interview we had with Anna Angelic. So let me share it with you. We, we have the opportunity to combine our own aspirations. Maybe I'm really into sustainability, but I'm also into fashion. So how I'm going to combine those two things? I'm going to buy sustainable fashion, but I'm also, what all, uh, what else am I going to, to do in a sense? So I think we are influencing each other. We have the means to influence, we always influence each other, but I think now that's more visible and that's why trends move so fast because influences come and go and spread and then they, they're contained. So in a sense, um, what we are seeing that more the, is that the role of brands are to sort of tap into that mood that is already happening, what people are already talking about, what people, how people are already starting to behave and to amplify certain behaviors. So the interesting thing that we believe is worth mentioning here in the in the relating networks and perception of value is that uh, so far, essentially brands and organizations are pretty much used to uh, um, operate into the market level. So if you look at the, the TIMN framework for David Romfeld, uh, just to clarify, this means uh, tribes, institutions, markets, and networks. So, so the point that David Romfeld has made in this essay from 1996 uh, is that um, essentially networks are the next stage of evolution of human institutions. So there are very interesting questions that arise now in trying to understand how organizations and brands are going to play their influencing role in, this, in the layer of networks. So they, we are pretty much used to how brands work in markets. So essentially, Anna, for example, in the interview made very clear that marketing is about convincing someone that if you buy something, your status will, will change, you will improve, let's say. But the big question is, so markets and buying, you know, markets are related to the idea of consumption and buying something. So when we move into networks, how, does it, how is it gonna, how is it gonna work? 
So these are very interesting questions to, to look into and look into the meaning of the brand uh, as we move from markets into the age of, of networks. Uh, Stina, do you want to add something on this? No, I just want to also for the housekeeping, uh, Mark Antoine, you're happy to comment uh, in the writing or also now if you want to add something live, uh, let, us, let us know. Yeah, especially I think uh, we are happy to get here some highlights from your side, especially if you guys can relate to the interviews. So if you have some something that you want to remind, for example, the group, about an insight that you had in during listening to these interviews related to the topic, you are really welcome to do so. Otherwise, maybe you can add the post-its in the, in, during the breakout uh, sessions. I, I just wanted to make uh, the point that a lot happens, of course, at the interface between the groups. I mean, the point in writing. Well, that, that's true for true. Well, that's true for sure, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, we just used this uh, breakout idea and uh, uh, clustering of groups as a way for facilitating topical conversations, but we are pretty uh, aware of the con trans contextuality of everything, as Nora uh, Bateson <laughs> would, uh, would say, you know, so everything is pretty much interconnected. All of these conversations, you can explore them uh, in the trans contextuality of all these topics. So, so uh, you're right. So coming back to the, to the flow uh, uh, looking into group number four. So topic number four is about policy making and uh, uh, jobs, works and capabilities. So this is something very in, uh, important, uh, we believe. And it's all about uh, understanding what is the impact uh, of these uh, patterns into uh, the existing institutions and the existing uh, social agreements that we have. Uh, to explore this, we are going to piggyback on mostly on uh, J James Carrier, um, James Carrier uh, interview. So uh, uh, yeah, that's a bit uh, uh, a series of uh, uh, quotes. So let me just open them. So first these two. So first of all, on the, on the, the fact that these uh, uh, in types of interface are going to play out everywhere. Anything that we care about, anything that forms societies is going to be digitized, is going to be touched by the efficiency that these interfaces bring. And therefore, understanding how they work and why they work is critical to almost any job that we have. Uh, no matter where we sit in the economy. And I think <clears throat> while that will be, um, it'll, it'll play out in different places at different times, I think taking that approach and that attitude to realizing it's going to touch everything, I think is the best way to begin the experiment of trying to understand what's about to happen over the next 20 years. I think it's the universality of, of, the, of the interfaces and the, just the data collection. If you look at how the world works before, how the world works before the internet, um, it, it did not appear to be driven by math. But in fact, if you, if you look more deeply, you will see that it was driven by math. It's just we couldn't watch the math happening. I think so it's the, the point that uh, James is making in these two uh, quotes. Um, it's about the fact that when, when he speaks about this, this interface, he's talking about markets, networks, sorry. So platforms in a way. So uh, I think uh, to, in, in James Carrier points, uh, it's a bit of a mix between networks and markets. But, but the, the point that he wants to raise is that once you can organize a particular context or, or, or ecosystem or marketplace uh, through this platform interface, which is essentially a way to use technology to connect the players in this market, the advantages that you have in terms of uh, visualizing how this market works are so huge that this is gonna play out everywhere. So everywhere we, we have people interacting and exchanging value, we will feel the need to organize through technology because this is gonna add, uh, it's going to make it visible uh, a quantity of data that we're gonna use to optimize this market which is gonna, that is gonna make it, um, I would say, a no-brainer to adapt to the platform model on each market. 
so this is the point that he's bringing. And on top of this, I think it's really, really important to, to um, focus on the, the, the other part of the uh, reflection that uh, James is offering us. So let me just open the three links. So this, when he speaks about this, he speaks about this fact that this interface is going to play everywhere. This has two, in my mind, um, one, one really positive impact and, and two negative impacts on society. The positive impact, of course, is efficiency. I can now find the right product or the right service uh, for the lowest price that I couldn't find before. This is great. This is wonderful. Uh, it enables all sorts of magical experiences to happen, like Uber and Lyft and, and whatnot. The negatives that people don't talk about as much are the fact that in most human labor markets, there is a power law. So, for instance, in the United States, I believe the statistics are that 7% of the re residential real estate brokers broker over 85% of all the transactions in the United States. That's a big market. That's a small number of people. The Internet and these marketplaces drive the power law to be more extreme than it has been in the past, which means that it's going to hurt the middle class dramatically. In many markets, the transparency of data is going to drive a steeper power law so that the winners win more and the people who are behind get further behind. So that's, that's, I think it, it was a very revealing uh, way for us to look into this uh, uh, idea of uh, uh, platforms and technology as a main driver of transformation on the, the, uh, the job market. And as a consequence, as a uh, clearly pushing for an approach, a different approach to policy making and regulations. And it's not a case, I think you also familiar with that because we spoke about this in our on our blog, if you're not, uh, I think I can, uh, I can uh, signal this to you, that uh, um, the next paradigm shift in technology is not going to be technological, but as we have explained in this blog post, uh, piggybacking on Ben Evans' presentation and other things, it's really going to be about regulation. So it's going to be about uh, how we, um, I would say uh, maybe something uh, around here, how we as a society, we, we're going to regulate uh, uh, these, uh, uh, these markets. So, so in this post, you can find a lot of insights on this, on this topic. But coming back to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the group, uh, I think uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is the, uh, the main idea that we would like to, to discuss in this uh, group number four. Estina, do you want to add something to, to this? Uh, to this topic? Um, no, maybe just, uh, I mean, the, the requirements, yeah, you already mentioned that it's this view, of course, on, on the power law can also be like, it's quite concerning from the point of view uh, when we think about like the kind of education that we need and the kind of uh, shifting so much responsibility on individuals also will will require entirely new ways of thinking about how we uh, you know empower people protect people and educate people uh, so i think that's uh, um yeah that's uh, that's something that uh, we we really want to explore as well yeah indeed uh, education uh, it's one of the topics that is emerging very profoundly from these uh, conversations that we're having and uh, we're going to talk about this maybe a little bit more in the end of the call, but we are really thinking about doing some special episodes, some special podcasts uh, on the topic of education, because we really feel that we need to re, uh, uh, restate and understand how education plays a role in this transition. So finally, the last group is about organizational devolution and uh, uh, brands um, and also institutional evolution. So, so how, how are institutions are evolving, uh, both the private ones and the public ones? 
And here we're gonna offer you uh, uh, two, uh, two, uh, two points. Actually, Michelle Bowen's points is a bit of a mix between uh, group number four and group number five. So, so let's start from Bowen's that he is focusing, and Bowen's is it's a trailer, because you didn't see, you didn't uh, listen to the podcast yet, it's not public uh, yet. But uh, uh, Bowen's in a passage of his interview uh, spoke about the idea that we need to develop uh, these uh, um, patterns and protocols for the interplay between the public institutions, the government and the commons through platforms. Right, so I think we have a twofold problem. One, one is what we have, you know, weak commons institutions. Uh, we don't have strong commons institutions yet. And the other problem is that we have state forms which cannot cooperate uh, with, with these commons, right? Um, and uh, I think Italy has given some examples of how this could be done. Because after the Bologna regulation, uh, the regulation for the care and regeneration of the urban commons, you have 250 cities which took it over, and according to cal the calculation, between 800,000 and 1 million people who are involved in this project. So, so you have there already what I call a partner state protocol, a public commons protocol. So you have in Italian cities a way in which citizens can do a project, can be recognized by the state, and can be supported in you know, the, um, what they call the five, uh, the quintuple uh, governance, multi-stakeholder model. So what is uh, Michel uh, trying to uh, stress here is that uh, um, uh, we're gonna see increasing need to uh, have institutions, to, for, for institutions to develop the ability to collaborate uh, with uh, the co with the uh, citizens and in general with uh, um, somebody that is outside the institution, and to do that you need to develop protocols. So th this interface between the institution, both private and public, we will see in a moment, and the, the contributors from the outside needs to be regulated with uh, transparent protocols. And we found something resonating with that. Uh, with uh, uh, in the interview that we had with Bill Fisher, that it's also something that you did, you didn't listen yet, uh, which is coming up. Uh, and uh, in this interview, Bill is referring to higher group. You know the Chinese company that uh, that is famous in the world for having transformed in the direction of being an ecosystemic company. So let's listen to Bill and what he, he has to say. Historically, most organizations are built to deal with uncertain futures, things we've done before we're familiar with. We just don't know the day-to-day -day variations. This is much bigger than that. This is, we're, hire is dealing with a future that, the, the smart home that nobody had ever had to deal with before. So, so they, there's, it's hard for them to predict what's going to be successful or what isn't because there's no basis of historical evidence to make those predictions on. And so what Hire has begun to do is to say we need more ideas rather than fewer. Let's 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 break down the barriers that have kept outside ideas away from us, and then let's let people take chances. And and who better to take chances than the employees who are either passionate about an idea or closer to a customer and understand those ideas. So, so uh, here both Bill and Michelle are basically pointing out the fact that institutions of the future need to be more able or in general need to be able to uh, think in terms of outside in approaches and that this uh, capability to integrate outside uh, contribution into the mission of the institution is gonna be regulated mainly through transparent protocols, transparent interfaces that you can engage with. So when we think about platforms, we really need to think about uh, this idea of uh, uh, transparent interfaces and protocols to enable the collaboration. So, those, this is another point that we wanted to, uh, to quickly uh, express. Stina, do you want to add something? Maybe just that there are two, the two clusters. So we have this like organization and evolution, and then what we see there as the role of the brand and, and basically that we, 
we saw that already some brands like direct to consumers and this was again from like Anna's interview are already quite doing that from the beginning so we have like this kind of the incumbents that maybe can like opening up like higher and then those that build it from the beginning in in sort of the dna of the yeah of the business model right Yes, uh, we increasingly see this uh, uh, somehow this difference you know, between the brands and the organizations that are native into this age and the institutions that are coming from uh, the age of markets uh, and the need to adapt to this transition. So this is for sure something that is emerging. So th that was a, a way to quickly in, you know, in, in a few minutes to quickly get you um, to engage uh, with uh, the topics through the world of uh, the people that we have been able to interview. So uh, now I would love to uh, uh, open the space if there are some practical questions on, on, on something that you guys want to add, again, based on the uh, insights that you may have generated by listening to these interviews. But in, in a few minutes, I would really love to jump into breakout rooms, topical breakout rooms uh, that you can choose and uh, spend 25 uh, minutes in these rooms uh, in small groups to engage around uh, these topics. And uh, the idea is to engage with those topics and possibly add post-its notes. Now you, you can add post-its notes in this board. It's open for uh, external contribution. You just need to have, I guess, a Miro account. And, uh, uh, and, um, and yeah, I mean, this is more or less uh, what we would like to do in, in the coming 25 minutes. A any question that you, or, or, or something that you wanna share before we move into the breakouts? Just one practical. Yeah. So maybe if, uh, to deal with how people have chosen, no, the, the number to yeah, make the breakout rooms, maybe, I, can, I will do that. So uh, uh, what I will do, uh, if you guys are ready, I will create the, the, the breakout rooms. Uh, uh, you, can, you can write in the chat the number of the breakout room you want to join. And I will, I will put you in the right breakout room. Yeah, that was to, just a way to know. So you can take now a few minutes. So we decided, uh, we, we said that uh, uh, it's good and it's a good idea for you to take now uh, five minutes. So we're go I'm going to put a timer now. In five minutes, you can browse the post-its and browse the topics and take your time. And then you choose the number. As soon as you choose the number, I'm going to put you in the breakout room. And, uh, 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 and then when the timer is done, I'm going to start the breakout rooms. Simone, you have a, a, a question regarding adding uh, post-its to the different groups on the board. Uh, uh, is it only going to be open during the uh, breakout sessions or will it be open afterwards? No, we're going to, well, uh, uh, I think we're going uh, we're going to open it uh, during this breakout session and then uh, Possibly uh, we're going to have uh, to discuss this in the Discord channel because ideally we don't want to leave it open uh, um, uh, forever because people can maybe mess up with the, uh, you know, even, unavo even um, unwantedly, but uh, we want to keep it a bit more controlled. So it's a good idea to add the posts now and then if you guys want to add more later, uh, we're going to open maybe uh, in coordination during the uh, through the Discord uh, channel. And also, since you mentioned, you will see, David, uh, that we added some uh, insights that we took from your uh, blog posts already to the board. So yeah, thanks a lot also for, for doing that. And, and yeah, some comments that Pascal had made in the, from the previous uh, sense making. So these are, and feel free, I mean, David, if you feel like they, you to move them, but this is something that we um, thought added in another point of view also to the to the board <clears throat> so I'm gonna start the five minutes timer just to let you guys uh, browse the post-its a little bit and clear up your idea and then as soon as you have an idea of uh, what uh, blo what group you want to join you can send it to me either privately in the chat or in the in the big chat and I will assign you to the breakout room and when the five minutes are over I will start the breakout room
So I'm going to restart the recording um, and quickly get back into the flow. I, I, first of all, uh, anybody that wants to uh, to share something, I think it was a very good uh, new experiment. Uh, uh, my my first impression is we want I want to do more. So maybe we can do some more experiments of uh, group. Uh, conversation about uh, about the research i think we need more time we're just getting like warm up in the yeah in the exchange and i think that's the that's where the richness is yeah even yes. maybe it would be helpful to have like some guiding question maybe so to because there is so few time that having some guiding question can help us to to not just navigate and see where to go but uh, at least starting in a direction so what we can do, we can share with you guys uh, um, uh, some kind of feedback, um, a feedback module. So if you want to give feedback to improve the community sense making session. Um, so it's a good idea maybe to ensure that uh, um, all of you are uh, join, uh, did join the, the Discord. Who is not yet on the Discord channel? Okay, Wolfgang and Stefano, if you are interested, uh, please uh, uh, just write to me in the chat and I will leave you, I will send you the link to the Discord, the Discord uh, channel. Where, where is that channel, Simone? It's a, it's a channel uh, that uh, we created only for the contributors to the research. So the people that actively want to uh, contribute to the research uh, and it's a way to uh, you know, basically we always uh, give uh, news and links and the, the file editing, for example, is always discussed over there. Oh, it's the Google chat, the Google... Uh... No, it's not a Google, it's a Discord channel that we created only for the white paper. Okay. So if you, if you guys want to have access, just write me on the chat and I will give you the link uh, right after the call. So... Um, before we close, as it's also Friday evening, and I think everybody wants to break to to come back to the lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking so, forward, really. Uh, and so we we wanted to uh, ensure that you guys all know. Um, Sorry, Simone. Yeah. Shouldn't we share some key things in a quick round? Yeah. Uh, maybe that's what you. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, I wanted to check that one rapporteur, one uh, rapporteur, one uh, person from each group can maybe share uh, some, you know, quick uh, uh, insights or direction of conversation that you felt were interesting. So let's start from group one. Uh, is there any uh, volunteer? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Um, well. I, I came with my uh, my concern, which I tried to express in writing. It's that many te traditional technologies have uh, are not well designed to allow multiplicity uh, to to represent diversity of point of view. So there's a single data model. There's a single way to do things, like in Coda's law. Mm -hmm. There's a single way to uh, express, uh, like in a mind map. There's one mind map for supposedly for everybody, and it's not clear who believes in what, if everybody agrees with the categories and so on. Uh, but those are just UX examples, but often there's an underlying data layer that is, has a single representation. Uh, that was my main concern. Uh, I think it's a, it's a problem with diversity and network things. And uh, I was uh, talking with Ivan, who was saying there's all these layered applications, especially in the blockchain world, to, um, and the layers often provide abstractions on these diversities. And we were, he was showing me examples I was not aware of, but I said, you know, a lot of that is, seems to be caught at the, at the transport layer rather than the data or UX layers where I think a lot of this needs to happen. And I think that uh, a good solution is also to expose the thick data, that means the historicity of the, like, I, I work a lot in event sourcing, so we have to know everything that happened in its full history to begin to make the links properly. Mm -hmm. In terms of, you mean, the history of the, the, for example, the history of the creation of such a technology? Yes. Uh, the history of the creation of any data model or any data, yes. Yeah, which is a technology somehow, no? Yes, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, group number two.
Any... Go on, Renzo. <laughs> Supporting. <laughs> yeah, I think we, uh, we focus on two areas, the global local interplay challenge and the resilience. And I think we, um, we look at uh, the, um, I think two examples. One is, I think, enabler and blocker. In terms of blocker, I was mentioning how the, the, uh, the current financial system doesn't really facilitate uh, local communities to uh, have a global impact. Um, I think uh, from uh, Ryan and Daniel also they were sharing about how the, um, the local networks are not, let's say, unknowledged, they're not very understood from the global perspective, how they, they could be enabled. So I think we just look at these uh, two areas of blockers and enablers about the global local interplay. Did you guys add something to the board with these considerations? Yes, yes we, did, we did, we did. Yeah, I'm also adding some more from the resilience. And so, and so you, you highlight uh, that we also spoke about resilience. And so I'm adding some keywords like uh, the, the, the work that is uh, following Daniel about uh, flow network and regenerative economics. So I'm just putting yes. there as, a, as keywords. Uh -huh. Yes, uh -huh. thanks. And then uh, feel free, Ryan, Renzo, to add. Uh, yeah, I would, I would like also to remind everyone that the board is going to stay open for uh, uh, after this. Uh, we close this call for a few minutes if you want to add more uh, post-its. Then we're going to close it for the editors because uh, uh, then, then we're going to share the link into the Discord, uh, in Discord channel. Uh, one question, Simone. So the board will be closed now. So later, if there is something to the hone on the... We're going to uh, leave it open for, let's say, until tonight, and then I'm going to block it. But just because since it's linked in the blocks, it's going to be, you know, the wise uh, just open to anyone. So we're going to uh, we're gonna um, uh, block it after the, the calls. So, but we're going to leave it open for, for some time. And then if you want to edit something, you just ask on Discord, and we're going to uh, allow you to, to do the edits. Okay, thanks. Simone, can can you you said you're going to leave it open until tonight, but it's morning here, so uh, could you leave it open till? Yeah, I will. Tonight? I will close it tomorrow. Tomorrow, so so you have 24 hours to do whatever you guys want to add. Yeah, thanks. But it, it, it's also possible to view it. Also, it's not possible to edit after this one. You always, have, you always have comments available, but just the editing, we're going to close it after, uh, after, uh, after to, you know, tomorrow so that everybody can do all the updates and then we're going to leave it closed. Okay, so viewing and commenting is always possible. Okay. Uh, number three. Faye, do you want to summarize what we talk? Uh, sure. So um, we did the uh, the one about the uh, perception of value and um, what was the other part of it? Social dynamics. And, um, you know, we started out and we, we pretty much all agree that uh, the, you know, market economy does not actually reflect value in the greater sense. Um, and uh, talked a little bit about whether or not this like the new ways uh the new, the new value exchanges that are happening in networks and amplifying those you know whether or not that um has uh what role that would play in for instance uh an organization um like uh the the you know especially those um in the light of user experience uh, which i i guess is the is the predominant model of today we talked we uh, also about so we talked about different ways in which it needs to be different including um a framework from um the uh field of psych developmental psychology um so we talked through different layers of consciousness and different types of you know different integration um methods and then talked about again how would that shift look like from user experience to what and one thing that uh, was mentioned was like relationship you know um, which is an ongoing thing whereas an experience maybe happens you know in, in moments uh, a relationship like enabling relationships to form of different sorts might and how does that happen I don't know but that's what we that's what we were talking about in containers and etc <laughs> 
Anything else, uh, anybody else, feel free to add. Yeah, I just want to add something very interesting that came out uh, that uh, uh, David also make, made the connection between the TIM and framework and paradynamics. That is something that I believe we, we need to research more. And uh, um, also a quick point on, uh, on the fact that, um, uh, you know, basically to overcome user experience, so to overcome this idea that the users drive the shape of the organization, we probably need to work both on the mechanisms and tools to empower new uh, constituents. So, so we need to basically let the awareness of these new constituents, such as communities, for example, to first of all emerge and then create tools so that it can be the driver for organizational uh, uh, shaping, you know, and, 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 and creation. Okay, uh, anyone else? Group number three that needs to add something? So we can move to number four. Yeah, I could speak to that. Uh, Steen and I got a, a bit here. We talked about, um, well, we were, we were focusing, um, you know, this is about jobs, work, cap work and capabilities, policy making, but we're also really kind of focused more on sort of the power law effects of how, um, how do you make it so that you have, and I, I see sort of this polarity map balance between efficiency and resiliency. And uh, we were debating this idea about how shapers can account for that. And there's a few things that we came up with. One is, is for example, when we look at reviewing the value uh, transactions and, and things like even onboarding costs and stuff and trying to account for the fact that the answers may be different for larger players and smaller players, uh, or as things kind of um, get out of balance. I mean, um, some of the notes that she put on um, on the Miro uh, actually even addressed my own sort of company at Farfetch, where our CEO has basically publicly gone out and said that sort of our reason for being right now is to ensure that small um, uh, fashion brands boutiques stay in business and um, that there's an importance in the diversity of creative arts and special areas that need to be uh, not be swallowed up by the others uh, because they have the resources, et cetera. So we also talked relative to the food supply. We talked about the idea of co-ops and how cooperatives provide some um, ability to address some of the common uh, entry costs and, and participation costs that might actually encourage more smaller players to sort of uh, stay and survive with that. Um, and one other thing is um, we were talking about um, even things like the idea of even subsidies um, and how um, usually the health of ecosystems depends on that diversity. Uh, there's always a balance and usually it's even in the interest of the larger players to have some survival of others for the diversity and health of it because it's gonna be more resistant to shocks and other sort of effects. And so how can you look at ways of being able to um, tilt the balance a little bit to help subsidize some of the smaller players who would otherwise have a hard time grasping on? Very interesting. Uh, it makes me think about uh, uh, about uh, niches as well and the balance that we need to find between niches and so 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 not clearing up all the small ones because we need to keep this diversity. So lots of very interesting thoughts. Um, group five. Who wants to to speak? I can speak to group number five. Mm -hmm. um, so we were um, weaving all of these ideas and, and, and we needed a little bit more time because it's a very passionate subject. But basically we started with the idea of the, uh, we started understanding, thinking about the organizational level and then what that has to do with the individual and identity. Um, and also we debated on the idea that, that this kind of like new era of, of, of 
platforms, a lot, it's important to, um, to be open and transparent and that enables trust. And somehow like we, the narrative that also enables that trust to be transmitted is, is through, through this um, ideas of, of um, the mythologies, the narrative, and um, somehow um, there's this fascinating idea that how can we enable uh, organizations to be more transparent to, and which is in a way uh, that reduces the, um, the the level of control that you need to apply to the to, to the to the system so and that was that was really really fascinating um we also talk about um the fact that um organizations uh so how can you build more trust uh, and and we kind of like um we're thinking about methodologies about narratives about also behavior and and how do you enable that behavior to happen um so kind of like um connected also behavior with culture and you connect culture with with people so it's it's really just like a mass uh of of topics that we're we're trying to connect thank you uh this really connects with the upcoming interview that we did with michelle uh, bowens that is going to be out next week and uh, uh, the one that anna uh, with anna angelich so i really suggest you guys to look into this both of these interviews um, so so i would be happy to to know um, your to have your feedback after you listen to these two interviews especially one from anna angelich because it talks about this idea of branding, but uh, uh, the one with the Michelle Bowens is also has a lots of uh, uh, lots of uh, thoughts uh, regarding reporting and uh, new uh, reporting uh, uh, technologies that may enhance the transparency. And so, as I understand, you mentioned this idea that transparency may be an enabler of uh, uh, lower control. So I lower control and 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 in a way also also more trust because mm -hmm. it's transparent you trust it and then the, the, there's a change in value perception yeah, automatically this, this is definitely very interesting because i think uh, one insight that we also want to share is that uh, uh, reporting and transparent reporting uh, emerges as one of the uh, prerogatives of the international level no, so so you, we spoke about this international and this global and this local layer and it, 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 after this interview we had with Michel, it came out that uh, this idea of uh, uh, the, you know, uh, the, the international level has this prerogative to uh, uh, regulate and do policy making in the context of uh, 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 accounting and reporting. So basically uh, accounting of uh, externalities, for example, and things like that. So, so uh, these things need to be uh, enforced at this international level. But this is just a conversation that we had with Michelle, so it's not, uh, uh, not, uh, uh, you know, not, not in final, I would say. So, but I, well, I would encourage you to, to, to listen to that conversation and maybe familiarize with the reporting 3.0, that is one of the case studies that we are thinking about uh, uh, to, 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 to explore. I think there was the one more point that came up there that I think we should mention is, um, you know, especially if you look at um, the interplay between the brands and the organization and, and think eventually the possibilities of loose coupling that eventually you have a, a branded network instead of an organization. So uh, how the value exchange can be better captured and documented and, and especially if it's um, in between the companies or the, the the individual and the organizations yeah sorry uh, i was distracted so if it was a question to me you need to to answer because i was answering to someone in the chat <laughs> no i mentioned one of the uh, uh one more topic from our group okay so it was another question so sorry about that no that was a comment uh that's that's more or less i think uh, everything on the breakout uh since we are pretty late what i would like to do is just uh, uh essentially tell you a few more things so one thing is uh, uh we're gonna follow up in the discord channel with 
uh, all the links. Uh, the, the, the board stay is going to stay open for further comments. Uh, so if you still want to spend like five minutes now, for example, to get back to the, war, to the, bo to the board and add post-its now after the conversation is still possible, and, and I suggest you to do that, then um, uh, we're going to uh, um, send in the Discord also a small survey, a small feedback, uh, so that we can uh, iterate the community uh, sense-making holds, like in terms of frequency, for example, or structure and so on. Uh, then, uh, uh, last bit, uh, at the moment, it's possible to contribute to the research in a, a couple of ways. I'm just going to announce them because then we have an entire video that we recorded on Tuesday uh, with Ivan and uh, Stina, and uh, it's going to be there for you if you want to understand more. But essentially, you can contribute at, the, at this moment, you can contribute in two ways. One is to help us to redact the case studies. We now have nine or ten case studies that we are prioritizing and we want to uh, explore uh, through a lens that we are going to explore probably explain uh, in the channel or in the next call because it's too, too long to be, to be done now but uh, the explanation on the video that i mentioned covered this aspect so the video explains very well how you can redact the case study and then uh, another step is to uh, help us with the review of the transcripts. So as you know, we're doing interviews and we're doing the transcripts and we're looking for people that want to uh, give a contribution in terms of uh, 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 re-listening the interview and reviewing the transcript and identifying the highlights a little bit like we did today. So if you wanna have access to one of the interviews in advance, you wanna spend some time reviewing the transcript and give us a help in understanding and identifying the highlights, this is something that you can also do. We totally foresee that in the future, you will have more possibilities to contribute. I wanna stress one point. Here we are learning together. How do you, how do, you do editorial mass uh, co collaboration on an editorial piece? And so, so it's something we are evolving. You know? It's not something that is decided yet. But we foresee that in the future, there will be, for example, some editorial work to do. So reading and, and commenting uh, drafts, and so on. At the moment, uh, we are now approaching the first release of the draft table of content. We more or less expect that the next, uh, uh, at the end of next week, we're going to have a draft TOC, and we, of course, we're going to share it with you. And and probably it's going to be the topic of the next uh, uh, community uh, sense making call. That uh, most likely is going to be. Uh, uh, earlier than, than the end of the month. At the moment, we have blocked the 20, uh, sorry, the 15th of May, right, Stina? So keep yeah. this in your calendar, 15th of May, same, same time. time. Today, uh, we're gonna send you the, um, uh, we're gonna send you to the, the, all the information, but based on your feedback, we may have some intermediate sessions, uh, at least maybe one in 15 days where we can maybe explore the TOC and do some, some more uh, work together. Uh, that's it. Uh, any question? Okay. So, well, I want to thank you. Sorry, maybe I can just, yeah, just reinforce also because for now, since we are going uh, forward with the podcast uh, publication also every week, we have a new release. If you can help us to push this also like and share and rate that would be great also so that we can increase the the reach and the diversity also of the listeners and that we can continue to engage in this uh, conversation get feedback get people's ideas it's really extremely enriching so thank you so much for also for sharing uh, your time and and yeah, uh, so on when we hope that we can keep this also in the discord channel and yeah. So thanks for that. <laughs> Definitely. That's so, so as a homework, you need to go back to your bet you to prefer the podcasting platform and review the podcast and, and, and help us to spread the word, uh, give out a couple of tweets to the medium post and so on. So, well, I mean, I'm grateful for ha to have you and uh, it's been great to, to have this conversation with you guys and I'm looking forward to, to, to catch up on the Discord. 